This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will listen to an interview with Mr. Sergeant and a customer care officer of a vacuum cleaning company. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello. Yes, hello. It's Tom Burlinson calling from Clean It Vacuum Cleaners. Mr. Sergeant, is it? Yes. I understand you recently purchased a vacuum from us. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Well, this is simply a call to find out if you've been happy with your purchase. Our company prides itself on its after-sales service. Just because you've bought from us doesn't mean you're no longer important to us. Could you spare a few moments to answer some questions? Sure. How long will this take? Well, not long at all, Mr. Sergeant. Usually only about three or four minutes. OK. What would you like to know? OK, great. I'll just go through the survey form, and uh, if you'll just bear with me, this shouldn't take long at all. Uh, OK, first question. Which model did you purchase and when? Yes, it was the Super Cleaner. We bought it about two weeks ago. Uh, let's see, it was a Monday, I think, because my wife's birthday was on the Sunday, 24th. Uh, that would make it the 25th. Yes, August the 25th. OK. Now, do you remember the name of the salesperson? Was he worth remembering? Yes, his name was Jim. My wife and I were very impressed with him. He was a great source of information, very helpful. Great. I'll make sure that your kind words about Jim are passed on to him. OK, now let's see. Ah, yes. Have you purchased any other products from us this year? Oh, let's see. Uh, of course, we bought the super cleaner. I think that's all. Well, we bought some vacuum bags with it as well. Um, uh, I think Daisy bought some carpet cleaner from your store back in February. That's about all, I think. I have to ask my wife about that one. She's not here at the moment. No, no, that's OK. Your answer will do fine. We don't have to be too picky. OK, so how much money would you say you've spent, all told, in the store? Just an approximate amount will do fine. Wow, that's a difficult question. Uh, I don't really know. The, the vacuum was £150. The other stuff, I'd say around £15, I suppose the total was around £165. But I couldn't be totally sure. It may be a bit more than that. That's fine. That's fine. Now, the next thing on my list is how would you rate the quality of the products you purchased? Good, actually. Very good. So far, we've not had any problems with the products from CleanIt. Service and value have been very good. So I guess you have a loyal customer. Oh, wonderful. I'm really pleased that your experience with our company has been a positive one. Tell me, do you purchase any other items of cleaning equipment? If so, from whom? I'm very fussy about the interior of my car, you know. The seats and carpets, I found a product from Easy Clean which works well on the carpets and an air freshener from Mr Tidy that really smells good. Apart from that, oh, I couldn't say for sure, I think my wife buys floor cleaner from Johnson Brothers. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Well, we've just introduced a new line of car fresheners. You might like to stop by. We'll offer you a 20% discount. 
Okay, we're almost to the end of the questions. Now, I know you were happy with Jim, but overall, how would you rate the quality of our service? Fine. I thought it was good. The lady in accounts was a little unfriendly, but overall, I would say the service was quite good, actually. Jim made all the difference, and you certainly seem to be a very nice person. Oh, thanks, Mr. Sergeant. Please, uh, uh, Tom, call me Terry. Oh, OK, Terry, very good. Second last question. We're thinking of expanding our trading hours. When are the best times, the most convenient for you to shop? Oh, I'm not a shopper. I mostly leave it all up to my wife. She works full time. Let's see. For me, I guess I'd have to say Sundays between 1 and 3, and uh, I'm not working on Thursdays now, so if I had to, I guess Thursdays between, say, 11 and 12 noon. OK. Last question, Mr Sergeant. Terry, do you have any other suggestions for us? Anything at all? Well, come to think of it now, there was one thing. Turn up the air conditioner. I seem to remember sweltering in there, and it was unpleasant and hot. Also, and this is just me, I always like to have some music playing, you know, quietly in the background. It just makes the place seem friendlier, you know, more professional. Well, I'll certainly mention that to management. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for your time, Terry. If there is anything we can do in the future to help you, don't hesitate to call us. OK, bye now. Yes, bye-bye, and thanks again. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear an interview with an adventurer, Colin Clark, about trekking through the Sahara Desert. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. After years of planning, Colin Clark finally got the opportunity in the winter of 2002 to visit and trek through the magnificent Sahara Desert. Earlier today, I talked with Colin about the trip and recorded this interview. Colin, thanks for taking the time to talk with me about your recent adventure. Tell me, how many days did the trip end up taking? It wasn't one of the easiest things I've ever done, let me assure you. Even with the assistance of my two travel companions, it was more difficult than I had expected it to be. Let's see, the first day was the third, no, no, the fourth. Yes, we arrived back on the 18th, so all told we spent 14 days trekking through and around the Sahara. Although it only got really difficult after the third day. Out in the Sahara, you can forget about your nice, comfortable bed. Try as I might, I couldn't get comfortable at night, so after day three, I was feeling weary from lack of sleep. Fortunately, that changed after a few days, but those sleeping bags took some getting used to. And how did you travel? Well, most of the trip was either in a four-wheel drive by land or by river in a type of canoe which the natives call a piro. What was the weather like? Winter season is the dry season. In fact, our guide told us that it hadn't rained in winter in 20 years. 
Out in the desert, people don't even bother setting up a tent. They just jump straight into a sleeping bag. You can imagine our surprise when on day eight we encountered a little light rain. Anyway, on our first day, and I remember this moment well, the sun had just begun to rise. I was sitting on the roof of the four-wheel drive, photographing some of the landscape. At that very moment, we knew we were going to be in for some scorching weather. It was only about 8 a.m., and the roof of the car was getting too hot to sit on. I asked the guide if he knew what the temperature was, and he said it must be at least 85 degrees. That's Fahrenheit, by the way. And this was supposed to be the cool of winter. The rest of the trip was pretty much the same, although at night there was a considerable break in the heat. One night I even needed a blanket, which is pretty common at that time of the year, but it was never that cold. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Highlights. Uh, I assume there were many, but are there any moments that really stand out above the rest? Yes. I'd have to say the simple pleasure of camping out in nature, especially at night, was a highlight. The light of the moon and the stars was just breathtaking. Not a sound to be heard in the still of the night. I won't forget that amazing experience. On day 12, we arrived at the Niger River, where we had to take a ferry across to Timbuktu. You don't know how uncomfortable a four-wheel drive can be until you've bounced around in one for four days. In most parts of Africa, you have to drive through mud and deep potholes to get around, and this was certainly the case travelling to the ferry. When we got to the river, there were 26 vehicles waiting to board it. Wow! But I'll tell you, finally arriving at the Niger River, and getting out of that four-wheel drive was a much welcome break which I won't forget. The ferry itself was built to hold five vehicles and was supposed to take an hour and a half to make the return trip. We realised it was going to take a better part of a day to get on the ferry so we decided to take a piro over to Timbuktu with our luggage which was another highlight for me personally. The piro is an interesting form of African transportation Basically, it's a modest-sized vessel which resembles a dugout canoe. They're a common way to travel a river in that part of the world. They range in size from two to six person, but they never carry those numbers in Africa. It's not uncommon to see a piro built to carry two people actually carrying eight people, or the larger six-person size with 20 people on board. But it has to be people that don't place a high value on their life. I see. Most of the piros are propelled by hand, but a few have motors. There's a larger canoe that they call a pinace. These are actually quite large. Almost all the pinaces have a motor and are used mostly for freight or cargo. I'd have to say that I'm very pleased to be safe at home. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear three linguistic students, Joe, Martin and Angela, discussing the presentation that Joe is giving soon as part of his course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the first part of the conversation, 
and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Martin. Hi, Angela. Hi, Joe. Yeah, hi, Joe. So you're really worried about your presentation, the one about names? I am. Well, you know your stuff on names pretty well. So it's just a question of selecting what you want to use. That's right. But there's so much. Well, you don't have to include everything. Let's start somewhere. Well, for example, there's a lot to discuss about people's names in terms of culture. It would be a good way to start, bringing in issues of religion, society. I thought so. As long as you can keep it concise, since it's potentially a large area. I'll pick out some key points. Good. Now, that will tend to be about differences. What about something on ways in which naming practices are often similar across different languages? Mm, that sounds good. I'm not sure how much I could say that's really about just names and not really general language. Maybe you need to give that some more thought. Yes, I'm not ruling it out. Well, what about what first names mean? That's got to be specific to languages or language groups. Yes, there are all sorts of different principles at work. It's a rich area for discussion. And you can present lots of examples. Mm, it would mean a good slide or two. <laughs> I'll enjoy making those up. <laughs> Don't forget to put our names in. <laughs> no, OK. Right, where have we got up to? Yes, now there's the question of place names. Ones where the name of the place is the word for the situation, like something to do with sea or mountain, etc. Yes. People often don't realise the origin. It sounds like it's just a translation issue to me. Don't you think you might give that a miss? Mm. Given the time limit, perhaps you're right. You need something on place names. Could you get history in? Actually, the way migrants often used to name places after somewhere in their country of origin is interesting. Sounds a bit narrow to me. Well, I'd hope to build it up a bit. Perhaps you should make a final decision on that later. OK, I'll see how the rest of it goes first. Is that the lot? No, there's still country names, the origins of those. I think that's an interesting area. Yeah, because it's something we often don't think about. It'd be a way to bring in various aspects. History, certainly. I could project a map of the world and have people match the original meanings to the countries. Well. That seems to be a foregone conclusion. Fine. Yes, I'm feeling clearer already. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 27 to 30. You know, there's another aspect that I think I'll cover. Yes? Brand names. Isn't that more to do with business studies? Well, international companies are finding it increasingly important to have brand names that can be used in many different countries. Oh, so they can advertise the same product everywhere? Yes, and it seems that brand names are very special in our brains. How so? Well, there was a research study recently, carried out on a group of about 50 students. They showed them 108 words, and the students had to say whether they recognised them as real words or not. The list included all mixed up, ordinary nouns, brand names and meaningless words, and they were shown all the words quickly. And the brand names seemed to be recognised strongly and in the emotional right-hand side of the brain. It was interesting that the brand names were recognised more readily if they were displayed in capital letters rather than lowercase, something which doesn't apply to normal words. How strange. What else did the researchers find out? Of course, it's a relatively small study, but they suspect that other visual features are at play. And so that, for example, colour has a major effect in helping us to store brand names in a special way in our brains. I suppose that's logical. But what do you... Well, they mean by a special way. I'm not saying I understood everything about this study. <laughs> of course not. But they seem to be saying that the power of brand names is that they conjure up a range of associations inside our brains, more so than ordinary words or names do. I guess this is great news for international companies. Potentially, certainly. Though exactly what they do... Once... That is the end of part three.
You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part 3. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture about balloons and airships. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, balloons and airships are worth consideration because while on the one hand they represent humans' first successes at air flight, after centuries of less than successful theory and experimentation, they also, on the other hand, continue to be used today. We may have appeared to have moved on to jet planes and space rockets, but you can still see these more primitive flyers in the skies. OK, um, gas balloons first. France saw the first balloon flight in 1783, and this began a process of development. By 1862, in the Civil War in the United States, we find Thaddeus Lowe replacing spies with balloons to go behind enemy lines. The success of this led to the continued use of balloons in peacetime, and they were employed in the creation of maps. And such applications continue to this day, with balloons assisting in increasing our knowledge and understanding of the world we live in. Unmanned balloons are still widely used to collect data to inform scientific research of various kinds. You'd be surprised at how much they contribute. All sorts of instruments can be mounted in a balloon, and ongoing investigations into climate benefit from the information that can be gathered from a flight. Well, that's gas balloons. Now... The increase in the popularity of ballooning as a sport or leisure activity has been mainly due to the development of the modern hot air balloon being cheaper and safer than the gas balloon. Heating air rather than using potentially explosive gas is what makes these rise, although the process doesn't generate as much lift as with gas balloons. But this is a small price to pay for its other benefits, and this type of balloon is no doubt here to stay. Airships are also fairly old in their origins. The idea for a balloon that could be powered and steered was first published in France in 1784, although 1852 was the date of the first successful airship flight. The first airships, like the first aircraft, didn't provide any weather protection for their crew, so it must have been rather uncomfortable up there. But designs continued to develop in sophistication. It was realised that the ships would drift about if they weren't strengthened, and that to work effectively, they would have to have a framework. Once designs started incorporating this, flights became longer and more reliable. Airships were deployed for various uses in the First World War, and once peace returned, designers began to turn their attention to ambitious plans for regular intercontinental flights. However, in the 1930s, this programme more or less came to an end. For one thing, the speed and popularity of airliners meant that the airship appeared superseded. They just couldn't compete. And as if that weren't enough in itself... 
Another factor in the decline of the airship was an alarming number of crashes, and this, of course, put people off. Nevertheless, several countries have continued to build smaller airships for various uses, such as naval observation or publicity purposes. In fact, their popularity seems set for a slight revival, and in the past few years, there has been renewed attention paid to the possibility of using them to transport cargo. Who knows? Maybe the 21st century will be the age of the airship. Now, if you look at your handouts, you'll see that I've included some information. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test.